Our speaker this week is Laura Zanna. Laura is a professor of mathematics and atmosphere and ocean science at the Courant Institute at NYU. Before moving to New York in 2020, she held positions at Princeton University, as well as here in Oxford, where she spent an entire decade. In her work, Laura studies the physics of the Earth's oceans and how they impact our climate. That brings with it the necessity of studying physical processes at a multitude of different length scales, which, as you can imagine, is not always easy. In her talk today, she will outline how machine learning can be useful as a tool not only to understand these processes better, but also how to use that knowledge to improve our climate simulations. And with that, Laura, please take it away. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the invite. And it's, it's nice to see many names in the audience that uh, used to be down the corridor from me. So, uh, so definitely uh, excited to be virtually uh, back uh, in Oxford physics. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about some work that we've been uh, up to in my group, uh, mostly on how can we use machine learning to represent processes in climate model that are not resolved. And I'm going to concentrate on the ocean because I'm, I'm a physical oceanographer by training. And so I'm the one speaking, obviously, but a lot of the hard work and the exciting work has been done, uh, you know, and led uh, by two people in my group. One is former PhD student, Tom Bolton, who actually got his, his DPL from Oxford Physics uh, back when I was still in Oxford. And a postdoc, Arthur Guillaume, uh, who is at uh, NYU Courant um, in the group. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an outline. Um, I'm gonna focus on machine learning for a very specific application in terms of climate modeling, which is, you know, how can we represent those, those subgrid scale processes, those small scale processes that climate simulations don't resolve. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna motivate a little bit the talk, right? I'm gonna tell you what a climate simulation is in case you don't know. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what we call model uncertainty, uh, meaning the models that we have, the climate simulators that we have are imperfect for many reasons. But one of them again is because we don't resolve many processes. And I'll show you that that impacts projections uh, over the 21st century of things like, pre like precipitations or temperature or other quantities that we care about when we actually try to predict the climate system. And so the main question is, you know, everybody's doing machine learning one way or another these days uh, for a good or bad reason, I don't know. But I'm, what I'm gonna try to argue is that it is possible uh, to actually use machine learning to represent those small scale processes that we don't resolve by using data, uh, either observations or very high resolution simulations of, of the ocean or the climate system in general, to actually try to capture those small scale processes and represent them in, in climate models um, in a way that is a little bit better than what we've done so far, which in general was basically using, yes, basic physics that we love, uh, but sometimes can, can be a little bit empirical and a little bit ad hoc. Okay, so can we do better than that? Or can we try to find the best way to merge physics with machine learning basically capturing enough information and data and physics to actually you know, try to come up with better representation of those processes. As I said, I'm a physical oceanographer. So I'm gonna concentrate on a process that I call mesoscale eddies. So they're basically 10 to 100 horizontal kilometer in scale. So that's what we're gonna focus on to actually try to make that argument. Now, of course, if machine learning can capture those processes so can capture a good representation for them, that does not necessarily mean that it will translate in better climate models because we need to take those representation and then plug them into existing climate simulation. That's not, that's not a simple task either. So you know, I'll discuss both the opportunity and the challenges that come you know, with, with thinking about those ideas of, of merging machine learning physics and climate modeling together. And is it possible to actually think uh, along the line of bringing physics data and you know, new algorithm uh, to help us move forward um, in terms of modeling the climate? So I'm pretty excited because um, you know, we, we get support from, from Schmidt Futures. So we have a large project uh, that just kicked off uh, just a few months ago to really uh, bring together climate modelers uh, you know, domain scientists from the ocean, atmosphere, and sea ice, and, and machine learning experts to actually really kind of try to tackle uh, this problem in climate models. So can we represent processes from the sea ice, atmosphere, and oceans by using machine learning and then plug them back into existing uh, community climate models that we use for making predictions? And so this is pretty exciting. It's a large, large international collaborations with many people and we're hiring as well. So if anybody's interested in the job, 
uh, there's a lot of, of exciting work to do in, in bringing physics and machine learning together. Okay, so I'm going to start with, with a little bit of motivation. I, by the way, I don't know if you ask questions in the middle, if it's at the end, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions, by the way, uh, as we move forward. So let me start with something pretty basic is how do we model the climate system? So in the best case scenario, we have equations. So for the fluids of the ocean and atmosphere, we have the Navier-Stokes on a rotating planet. Uh, so we have forcing dissipations and you know all, all terms uh, that you would include. For other parts of the climate system, we don't necessarily have equations. So for part of the thermodynamics or say the land, we have approximation of those equations. But nonetheless, we still write them down as a partial differential equation. But those are highly nonlinear, so obviously we can't do much uh, with them as is to actually make projections or, or, or do anything else. So what we do is we plug them in a climate model, uh, plug them in a model. And so to do that, we take those equations, we break them down into pieces uh, that we put in a piece of code, and then we solve them on grid in basically on a grid. So every single grid box of a climate simulator is basically a discretized version of the equations of motions that we have, uh, or the thermodynamics equations, or the land equation, and so on and so forth. So then you can imagine, right? So the more of those grid boxes you have, the more degrees of freedom, the higher the computational cost is. And so I'll come back to that in a bit. That's a way we actually simulate the climate. We start with equation, break them down into pieces, solve them on the computer, and uh, you know, the size of the grid is basically the number of degrees of freedom that we have when we consider all the equations. And so, as I said, you know, the more green boxes you have, the larger the number of degrees of freedom. So your computational costs kind of go up. But of course, your simulations are, of course, more realistic, right? Not just look prettier. So this is a coupled climate model showing sea surface temperature. So temperature at the surface of the planet, of the, of the ocean, sorry, in the same simulation, but at three different horizontal resolutions. So basically three different sides of the grid. Over here, it's an horizontal grid of about one tenth of a degree, so about 10 kilometers, if you want, along Antarctica. This is about a quarter of a degree, so about 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. And this is a coarser resolution run, so about 100 kilometer by 100 kilometers. So in general, climate simulators that we use for projections are run at those resolutions, which is relatively coarse compared to those high resolution simulations. And the reason for that is it's very difficult to actually run the simulations or even higher resolution do ensembles for hundreds of years. Again, the computational cost is a little too high and too steep. So usually we rely on those models. And the idea is, can we represent all those processes which you can see those are filament and steering and mixing. Uh, so can we represent all those missing processes in those coarse resolution climate model? So that's a big question, obviously. And that's the way the parameterization world works. So now, you know, we have climate simulators. They relatively coarse resolution. Again, they're not as they don't resolve all the processes that we want. And so, what does that mean for our projection? So we're going to look at a range of climate models. Um, and here we're looking at precipitations. So as a function of time, so on the x-axis is time. Uh, this is precipitation over here, and each one of the thin line is a prediction or basically a simulate a, a run uh, with the climate simulators the black curve here are the observations and the colors are for different emission scenarios so obviously we don't know how much we're going to emit in the future i very much hope uh, that we emit as little as possible or a lot less than than what we're emitting right now but this is part of the uncertainty and so that's something that we call scenario uncertainty so if we go to this plot on the right here uh, so this is basically uh, showing us the spread. So the fact that the climate simulators are di diverging, diverging in the prediction by 2100, so as a function of time. And so we have three different types of uncertainty. So one of them is going to be due to the initial condition. So you, know, you can think about basically the, the internal clock or the chaos of the, of the climate system. And so that, you know, that uncertainty will go away uh, in time. Now, the two other type of uncertainty, so one, as I said, is scenario. So this kind of green line over here. And that's going to increase as a function of time, obviously, because it's harder to predict um, you know, what we're going to emit. And that tells us that the projections, the, the uncertainty in the projections will increase depending on the scenario that we have. And so if I go back to the plot on the left, the different colors were for different scenarios. And again, as you can see, the amount of, of greenhouse emission that we'll put in uh, will give us a different uh, 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 projection of precipitation on the mean, but also a different spread. So the spread is the quantification of uncertainty. Now, the most important for us is the model spread. 
right? The fact that we have different climate simulators, even if you give them exactly the same, uh, you know, emission, greenhouse emission over the next hundred years, they still give you a different answer uh, that is independent of their initial condition or the scenario. That's what we call model uncertainty. And you can see it's basically the dominant source of uncertainty, especially on multi-decadal time scale. And that's from the fact that, again, we're not solving the exact equations of the climate system and the numerics and the lack of you know, processes that are important are actually introducing some uncertainty and some, some spread. So this is a plot for the previous generation of climate model, what we call CNIP5. If we, if we look at the same exact you know, quantities in the current generation of climate model, so add up CNIP6, so this is what you get. So overall, actually the model spread or the model uncertainty is actually now larger than it was before. So we didn't necessarily reduce the uncertainty associated with models actually has increased. And there are a few reasons for that, right? Where, you know, there, some of the models have, you know, uh, more complexity in them. So, you know, they have different feedbacks that, that, that are included. So it's not a, a reflection on the models being bad. It's we just have more spread because again, the complexity of the Earth system has also increased. But that also tells us that you know, a part of that uncertainty is associated to all those processes that we don't resolve and, and give us, you know, model spread overall. So if poor representation of some key processes, say mixing or clouds are actually affecting our, you know, our, our simulations and our projections, you know, do better. I tell you how can we do better? Let's, let's just try to think a little bit about what we've been doing so far, which has been extremely successful, just to be clear. So what we've been doing so far is, is trying to think or trying to represent mathematically what those processes do uh, in, again, a kind of a simple conceptual or idealized mathematical representation. So in every single grid box, whether it's the ocean or atmosphere, anything that is below you know, the, the scale of the model, the grid of the model that you're resolving. So say yeah, the ocean, we have basically you know, grid boxes that are 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer or 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. So things like clouds or ocean turbulence and ocean mixings are not resolved. So the way we've been tackling this in terms of, again, what we call a parameterization, is trying to come up with a simple mathematical formula that will represent this mixing or cloud processes. And we put that on the right-hand side of our you know, numerical simulators. And what we do there is basically, you know, if we, if we take the example of, of ocean mixing, say, so you can think that, you know, if I put some tracers uh, or if I put some dye in the ocean, it's going to get steered and it's going to get mixed overall. So I could write it as the Laplacian of the tracer, right? So it's going to be basically a diffusion operator or quasi diffusion operator. And it's going to have a parameter in front of it. And, and the diffusion operator, so the Laplacian, is going to act on the result scale. So basically only on what I have that is at the, at the size of the grid box. I'm going to move that around. So the, the closure problem or the parameterization problem is just to come up with a mathematical representation of those processes, whether it's cloud or mixing, that only depends on the result scale, because I have no information about what's not resolved. That's the way it's been typically done for decades. It's extremely successful, right? I mean, we've been able to represent many processes and how they you know, interact with the large scale flow. But nonetheless, nonetheless, they're uncertain. And you know, some of them are a little bit empirical. And so the question is, can we do better? Or at least can we do as, as good as that and, and hopefully a little bit better uh, by using the data that we have. So here, what we argue is, can we actually use the wealth of data set that we have now? So we have limited high resolution simulations or even global ones. We just don't have a lot of them. We don't have hundreds of years, so that, but we still have many of them. And so for example, you know, this is kind of, again, a, a picture of a high resolution couple climate model that is run at IOS. So can we actually extract information about those small scale processes uh, from existing observations or high resolution model together with machine learning algorithms? So, you know, how can we do that? Well, we have a lot of images, right? We have basically, you know, features. Uh, can we actually learn the relationship between those small scale processes and a large scale and extract enough information from that very complex and turbulent data uh, that will help us represent things like mixing and cloud and so on and so forth. So rather than going at it by saying, oh, well, I know what the, you know, what the large scale, you know, impact of those processes will be, just letting the data and the algorithm actually pick out a relationship for us. 
So, you know, machine algorithm, there's a lot of hype around it, don't get me wrong, um, you know, we all know that. But nonetheless, you know, we have a lot of data, we have new algorithm, is it possible to actually extract new information we didn't have before? So people have been working on this in the climate, uh, you know, arena, if you want, or the turbulence arena for quite, for quite some time now. So I'm just putting up, um, you know, a few examples here. So in turbulence, uh, basically mostly large AD simulation. So there's a very nice paper by Link uh, in 2016 that already start using, you know, convolutional neural network. So kind of complex algorithm to extract uh, information about turbulence by embedding uh, some, you know, symmetry properties of the tensors within it. So kind of blending physics and machine learning together. In the atmosphere, it started, you know, about a decade ago already uh, with a lot of, you know, basically a lot of papers thinking about how can we represent radiations or clouds uh, by extracting information from machine learning. And so now there is actually a large number of papers. It's actually almost impossible to keep up now, especially on the atmospheric side. Lots, you know, lots of paper looking at different processes from gravity waves to cloud. And I know some people in Oxford are actually working on this. So, you know, a, a lot of work is being done in, in extracting information from data directly. Um, so in my group, we've been focusing on the ocean. The ocean is actually less populated uh, when it comes to machine learning and parameterization. Um, so we've been working on this uh, topic of ocean mesoscale, as I mentioned, so I'll, I'll redefine that in a second. And there's another group um, you know, a couple of years ago that started working on vertical mixing. So uh, turbulent vertical mixing in the ocean and how we can steer uh, a tracer in general. So you know, we're seeing more and more and more people, um, you know, working in this in this kind of specific sphere of using machine learning for parameterization. So I think there's a, you know, there's a lot of potential. Uh, we don't know exactly yet if we're improving climate simulations. But what I'm going to do now is basically kind of use a couple of examples from our work and telling you the good and the bad. So um, it's, um, I'm not going to hide the things that don't work or the things we don't understand. But I hope to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's possible to do. And and you know where the challenges uh, lie. Okay, so we're gonna work on parameterizations of ocean mesoscalities. So as I said before, so that horizontal scale of 10 to 100 kilometers uh, roughly, and they're pretty important because they actually you know um, set what we call the stratification in the ocean. So the temperature profile is a function of depth, and they, that means they're also critical in you know steering and mixing tracer and taking up heat and carbon. So, you know, the ocean is a massive, uh, you know, reservoir of heat and carbon, and eddies play a pretty big role in actually, um, you know, steering and, and, and taking up those different traces. So if we look at this uh, um, um, nice little picture over here, we're looking at surface velocities uh, from a climate model run at three, three different resolution, a little bit like before. And so we're looking at surface velocity. And so that's actually uh, one of the, uh, um, the UK models. So on the right, uh, we have a climate model that is run at one degree, right? So what you can see is the surface velocity field is kind of smooth, right? It's, it's a little bit boring. There is no turbulence there. You can still see jets, uh, for example, over here, the Kuroshio, which technically is supposed to be quite turbulent, but you don't see that in the velocity features. If you increase the resolution, then of course you start resolving those mesoscale eddies and those features. So you can see a lot more filaments uh, and a lot more turbulence in regions like the Southern Ocean, for example, or the equator. To increase the resolution even further to the left, one twelfth of a degree. So now again, you know, roughly eight kilometer horizontal resolution, a lot more filaments, a lot more turbulence. So it's not just that, of course, you know, this picture looks a lot better than this one, but you're actually resolving scale interaction, right? So those small scale processes interact with the large scale flow. So they're not, you know, we don't have any scale separation. So resolving them and resolving their impact actually has an effect on the strength of say the Gulf Stream or in the Southern Ocean, the ACC, and how much you know, heat and carbon uptake we're gonna take up. So there's no, you know, there's no scale separation and that's why it's quite important to actually represent them pretty well. So now how can we come up with a parameterization of ocean mesoscalities um, you know, using data and using machine learning? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take a high resolution simulation. Um, so we have the equations and we have the data. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna diagnose the missing forcing from this coarse resolution simulation from the high resolution simulation. So we're basically gonna take our equation, we're gonna you know, low pass filter them if you want to coarse grain them. And when we do that, we end up with an equation that has an additional term here S, 
which is the turbulent forcing that we need to put on the right-hand side of a coarse resolution model to actually make it behave uh, like a high resolution simulation, but of course, without the computational cost. So first step, we're gonna take data from, from high resolution simulations. We're gonna diagnose this, this missing forcing term, which is basically you know, the nonlinear advection uh, that is impacting the, high, the, the flow. And then we're gonna ask you know, machine learning algorithm to actually learn that term as a function of the large scale velocities. So we're gonna let the algorithm just pick whatever function it wants uh, based on the input data and, uh, and again, this, this function S uh, that we're looking for. And I'm gonna give you two examples. One, which is, using, which is using neural network. So basically a little bit of a black box, right? So many, many uh, parameters can capture many complex features, but it's very hard to interpret. And, and I'll show you a little bit of that. And second example is gonna be an interpretable de equation discovery. So we're gonna try to learn equations from the data for this missing process. So now, even if we are successful at all of those things, and I'll show you, we are actually, we're doing a pretty decent job. It doesn't mean that when I take this S and plug it back into a coarse resolution client model, or in our case, gonna be very idealized flow simulations, uh, that it will remain numerically stable and that it will actually improve on the flow. And so there's a little bit of an art of tuning that is involved there. And all the problems that we have in general in climate simulation, numerical stabilities and skill and all those things actually don't go away because you learn a better function. They actually remain. So you know those problems are still there. And so I'll, I'll show you a few examples of that. Okay, so first example, we're gonna use neural networks uh, to actually learn that missing uh, forcing term. So we're gonna take um, idealized simulations because we can run them pretty easily and at fairly high resolution and gonna generate a lot of data. So it's a, you know, what we call a quasi geographic model. So very simple for those of you who, who know, if you don't, don't worry. So basically we blow wind at the surface of the ocean, we generate, uh, you know, uh, what we call a wind driven uh, circulation. So we have a, a subtropical circulation over here, a subpolar circulation over here. But the most important aspect is we have a jet here in the middle that meanders where there's a lot of, of you know, turbulence interaction and mesoscale uh, being developed. And so we're gonna give, we're gonna diagnose this missing, uh, you know, forcing this, this missing tendency that represents the impact of the mesoscale eddies on the large scale flow that is missing from a coarse resolution model. And we're gonna ask a convolutional neural network by just giving it a lot of 2D images, a lot of pictures, uh, you know, without more information, except that it knows that it's X and Y and there are many of them of that subgrid pulsing. And we're gonna ask it to learn it. So come up with a prediction S hat for that S term, okay? And so basically giving us back uh, an image uh, X and Y that only depends on the input, which is, the surface velocity field that will you know, best mimic this missing tendency. And so at the end of the day, we're just coming up with a new parameterization of ocean turbulence of momentum, basically, uh, from, that will be missing from a coarse resolution model. So, and we're making no other assumption than just giving it you know, snapshots of you know, missing tendencies uh, and asking it to come up with a new parameterization that only depends on uh, the large scale velocities. Okay, so the first, the first thing we've done, and so that was work uh, done by Tom, again, when he was a PhD student, was just try it out. We had absolutely no, no idea what we were expecting. Uh, and so that was quite interesting. So we started with a simulation with a given Reynolds number. So again, so flow simulation, this is gonna be X over here, this is Y, so you know, longitude, latitude. And we're looking at this missing you know, eddy forcing. So what you can see is where the jet is, this is where the missing forcing is you know, most prominent, which kind of makes sense, right? If you were running a simulation at coarse resolution, as we saw, the jets are usually more viscous and, and dissipative. So that's where you're missing the turbulence. So that's why you would want to represent it. So that's the true missing forcing, that's its standard deviation. That's the prediction made by the neural net, and that's the correlation between the two. So what you can see is that where there is forcing, we're doing a really good job. In regions where there is no forcing, the correlation drops, but again, there is no forcing, so it doesn't really matter all that much. So overall, you know, the black box kind of magic gave us a really good, uh, you know, really good answer for predicting this missing forcing. 
Now, if we don't retrain the neural net, right? So we're not giving it new data or we're not asking it to learn to relearn anything new. We're just taking that function that came out and we ask it to predict uh, the missing forcing from a simulation that has a higher Reynolds number, right? So basically the flow now is gonna be more turbulent. My expectation was that the correlation will actually drop, that, you know, it'll do a worse job at predicting a missing forcing from a highly, you know, from a more turbulent regime than it did on what it was trained on. Um, surprisingly, actually, that's not true. Did actually a better job at predicting a more turbulent regime. So that's why we see here, higher Reynolds number, exactly the same, you know, neural net parameterization. And so we give it again, the input velocity and ask it to predict the truth. That's the prediction and that's the correlation. So the correlation actually went up, especially in the turbulent region. So the truth is I have no idea why uh, it does that. Um, so it does a better job at generalizing to a higher Reynolds number. Um, we have a few ideas of why, uh, but it's actually very difficult to figure out why it does better. And it does better for standard deviation and for the higher order moments as well. So skewness and kurtosis. So it's not just a, a bit of an artifact of shifting, you know, the probability it actually truly does a better job, but I don't know why. So, you know, that's one of the issues with getting a great prediction. Sometimes you're actually not sure of why it does a better job and why it generalizes better. But still tells us that apparently there is more information in data compared to, uh, you know, the basic parameterization that I haven't shown you here yet. Uh, and we're actually getting higher scale by just learning it. And by the way, I haven't implemented it. Model yet. Now, one other caveat, in addition of not quite understanding what it's done, it's that it doesn't respect uh, conservation. So we didn't impose any you know, conservation laws. And so you can think about it already, right? If I want to take now this new parameterization and plug it in the climate model, but say I don't conserve momentum, then the parameterization might input momentum forever. So you know, your flow might accelerate without anything to damp it or might remove momentum overall. So one thing that we've done, you know, as a kind of follow-up work is we actually changed the architecture. So rather than learn the subgrid scale by itself, we, we learned a different component within the stress tensor. And then at the end, we took a derivative of that stress tensor. So then, you know, given the boundary condition, this entire term will integrate to zero if you have, again, kind of, you know, no normal flow and, and no flux at boundaries. So that's one way you can actually change the architecture to embed physics and embed conservation laws. And so, you, you know, we do it for momentum, you can do it for energy and mass and so on and so forth, depending on the problem that you have. So it's not completely out of the question to actually embed physical constraint within the architecture, but you need to work at it. It's not something that they'll know uh, from the, from, from the get-go, even if you give it something that is, you know, technically conserving properties. The algorithm is not going to learn that by itself. It has to be imposed. So that's, you know, something to think about when you actually learn those parameterizations. So as I say, it didn't conserve momentum, but we could fix that. It was based on very idealized data, right? So as I said, it's kind of, you know, those models are quite simplistic. Uh, there, there's only one forcing to some extent that doesn't change as a function of time, and there's only one scale interaction. And there's also no uncertainty quantification. So I learned a mapping between coarse resolution velocities and a missing turbulent fluid. Uh, but we know that, you know, those relationships are imperfect and uncertain. And so I didn't include any uncertainty quantification there. So that was some kind of follow-up work that we've been doing, which is using more complex data and uh, embedding, you know, some uncertainty quantification in it. So now we're going to take data from a, you know, couple climate model that is run at one twelfth of a degree. So, you know, much higher resolution, complex data. And we're going to actually, again, retrain a neural net. So now we're kind of forgetting about the idealized experiment. And we're just going to pick just a few regions in the ocean, mostly to see if you, know, you have limited data. Uh, you know, can you generalize to the full globe? And can you generalize to different climate as well? So we picked a few regions in this kind of couple climate model. Again, you know, the data is there. It's been kind of given by uh, you know, our colleagues at GFDL. And it's hosted on the Google Cloud, by the way, Pangeo. So you know, you can, anybody has access to it uh, if you want to. And actually try to train a neural network based on just those few, um, those few regions. So we're going to do exactly the same game as before. You know, diagnose the missing tendency learn a parameterization for the missing, you know, turbulent forcing, uh, given the input velocities. But now rather than learn just the mean, just a one-on-one -on -one mapping, you know, I give you the input velocity, I get one prediction. We're asking the algorithm to learn 
the mean and the standard deviation of that missing fault step. So now we're asking the neural net to actually learn two parameters if you want in, a, in, the, in the distribution by assuming that there is some uncertainty and fluctuation in this kind of highly turbulent force. So all we have to do is to change the loss function. So again, when we do the prediction, we you know, needed to optimize um, you know, some kind of loss function to give us the best prediction. So now we change this loss function. So it include both the standard deviation and the mean. So now what the neural net is gonna do is gonna predict at every single grid box, uh, the mean of the missing forcing and a standard deviation around it. So again, you can think about the standard deviation as, as the uncertainty associated with that mapping. We do that again at every single grid box and we learn on only four uh, small regions of the ocean with, if you want, different degrees of turbulence. So here are the results. Um, so again, learn on four regions and um, you know, learn a missing forcing you know, from a high resolution model that it was one tenth of a degree to uh, quote to uh, 0.4 um, in this case. So here's what we call the R squared. So it's basically a measure of scale, right? So how well does it do? So, you know, when you're over here, that means that the neural net is performing very well. If you're down here, that means we're doing a, a very bad job, but actually even bad job is 50%, which is still pretty good. Um, so overall, what you can see is in the majority of the ocean, the neural net can predict the missing forcing, you know, at the surface at least uh, with high degree of accuracy. So more than 70% accuracy. The regions where we do you know, the worst, if you want, in particular, are usually the high latitude that are covered in ice. And that kind of makes sense. We didn't train on any of that. So there's no, we didn't include anything that is interaction between the sea ice, uh, the ocean or the atmosphere, right? So all we have were just a few regions in the interior of the ocean. But nonetheless, it does a really good job, even in very turbulent regions that it hasn't seen before. So you know, it can actually predict uh, the majority of the globe. And so we only trained, and I forgot to say that, we only train on data that comes from a pre-industrial simulation. So where the CO2 levels are 280 uh, parts per million, but of course, you know, as you know, climate warms, surface velocity and turbulence changes as well. It can change by up to 50% uh, in many regions of, of, of the ocean. So what, again, if we use exactly the same trained neural network and validate it against data, uh, from you know, a simulation in which the CO2 is actually doubled. And so that's what we have here. So again, the same R square, the same scale, if you want, offline of, of our neural net. And what you can see basically overall is there is very little degradation in the prediction of the missing forcing, whether I'm in a, you know, whether I'm in a planet that is, has less CO2 than planet where there is you know, more CO2 without having seen any new information at all. So there's no degradation when we look offline at those, you know, at those at that scale, which is good news, right? That means that it can generalize to different regions, so different turbulence regions, as we said, but also different climate regimes. So that means the parameterization that we learn has some generalization properties that are not you know, totally constrained by the data you give it, which is good news. But of course, all of that so far has been learned completely offline, right? So all I'm doing is, you know, training on some amount of data, testing on bits of data the neural net doesn't see. But I haven't implemented it yet into a forward simulation. So now I need to take this term and plug it on the right hand side of the course resolution model to see if it works. Doing that in a real climate model is, is no easy task. Uh, There's something we're doing now, but so far, all we've done is using idealized simulation and try it out. So that's what I'm gonna show you now. So we took, a, again, an idealized model, and I don't know if, if Milan is in the audience, but uh, uh, Milan is in uh, AOPP and has you know, kindly, uh, kindly written uh, a, you know, a, a, a basically a Python code uh, to run a climate, to run a very simple kind of uh, flow equation model. And so you know, we've been using that because it's great because it's in Python, so we can interface really well uh, between, you know, between the neural net that is, that is being learned and, um, you know, and the forward simulations. So what we've done is, you know, on the right hand side of, of this kind of course resolution model that is run at 30 kilometer, uh, we put on the right hand side the learned um, parameterization uh, that we just kind of created, that we learned from, again, much more complicated data. And so we, we put that on the right hand side. Okay, so 
Now the question, of course, is what happens, right? So first thing we need to do is we need to decide how we're going to implement the parameterization. So it's stochastic in our case. So what we're going to do is for we're going to take the surface velocity from our coarse resolution model, and we're going to feed it through our learned parameterization, and it will sample, you know, a mean and a standard deviation. So the standard deviation is just going to be multiplied by some white noise, right? And at every single grid box, uh, we're actually picking a mean and a standard deviation that we plug on the right-hand side of the equation. So how does the simulation do compared to a coarse resolution compared to the high resolution? So that's what we're seeing here. This is global uh, kinetic energy as a function of time. So the blue curve is a coarse resolution simulation run at 30 kilometers without any parameterization. The violate curve uh, is the same simulation, uh, but run at higher resolution. And so you can see that the amount of kinetic energy, so the amount of, if you want, basically total energy in the flow is actually increased. The flow is more turbulent, so you expect to have more kinetic energy overall. And each one of the three curves that you can barely see, because they're almost indi indistinguishable from one another, are three simulations uh, that are run with this stochastic parameterization. So we have three ensemble members, right? Because it's stochastic, so you know, uh, each, each simulation will give you a, a slightly different result, but they kind of you know, all merge it into one. So overall, what you see here is that, you know, we can recover the total kinetic energy in a coarse resolution simulation using our learned parameterization on a completely different data set, uh, by the way, not even the same data set as the model that we're using here, without the computational cost of running a high, high resolution simulation. So even though learning and training a neural net, you know, has some expense, it's still a lot less expensive than actually running the high resolution simulation. So we can improve the simulation in those very, very idealized setup. It's stable, which was a surprise, by the way. If it's not stochastic, so if the simulation was purely deterministic, by the way, the model blows up. Um, so the simulations are not stable, and we need to tune down uh, the learned parameterization. Um, and the blow up is, can be different. In many cases, actually, it's not necessarily numerical instability, it's that the flow becomes completely unrealistic with extremely high velocities. Um, and almost kind of forget what the forcing is and so on and so forth. So there are very subtle you know, ways the scale interaction can happen that we don't necessarily understand. The stochasticity help actually kind of you know, uh, stabilize the simulation and that's not new. Many of us have seen that before in a range, uh, in a range of simulation, whether it's machine learning or not. So that's the good news, right? So you can learn something on the given set of data, generalize as well offline, and you can implement it at least in an idealized model and give you a pretty pretty good solution, a pretty good answer in those idealized setup. So that was the pros, right? Which I just mentioned. High scale, generalizable. When stochastic, uh, you know, it's kind of a true representation of the physics, but, you know, not necessarily, um, you know, a proper representation of the way you would think about it, but having a very simple kind of mathematical operator, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's pretty decent and, and again, kind of stable uh, when we're there. We could include some quantification of uncertainty within the loss function by learning a mean and standard deviation. The cons, hard or almost impossible to interpret. You can look at feature maps, heat maps, and the local gradient, and that's something we're doing right now. But half the time, if you don't know the answer, it's already hard to actually get there. But you know, there are options, uh, so I'm not going to say it's completely impossible, but it's definitely non-trivial. Need to ensure that the conservations are actually embedded within the within you know the architecture, so it's not learned directly. And the implementation, as I said, not always stable, uh, not necessarily easy to implement either. I mean, there are now kind of different softwares that kind of you know popping up everywhere to try to you know blend Fortran uh, and Python, uh, and there are many of them. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk later on. Now, the question, of course, is would it work in a couple climate model, right? When you actually implement it, not in an idealized model. Uh, that we could that we could easily do ourselves, or you know, or it's kind of a very different situation. So that remains to be tested and to be seen. And this is something we're doing, and I'll come back to it at the end. But then the you know the second approach, um, you know that that we've been trying has been okay, and it's in parallel right now. We're merging the two approaches actually. Uh, but in parallel, what we've done was okay. Black box is great, high skill, but I have no idea what's going on there. So can we try to target you know? from data parameterization that is a bit more interpretable. And can I learn new physics from it? And that was pretty exciting. 
So, you know, the idea came up by kind of reading this paper from Rudy et al, where what they've done is they actually run a simulation using Berger's equations, kind of idealized Navier Stokes. They use the full data collection and they come up with a sparse regression algorithm by which you actually give your algorithm a set of functions, a library of functions with derivatives and, you know, of velocities and curl and so on and so forth. Again, based on data, right? So the algorithm does not know an equation, but can give it, uh, you know, a piece of data from which you, are, you, are, you know, you, you actually map a given operator on. So you take your velocity, you take the curl, so that gives you the vorticity and so on and so forth. And you give your algorithm a, a huge uh, set of basis function that is based on the data. And you ask the algorithm to actually prune that set of basis function and come up with the equation that will, you know, best mimic the evolution of your flow. And so of course, what was beautiful is that they could recover, you know, the simulation that they created with, you know, some basically capturing, uh, you know, the right terms, if you want, with the right parameters in front of them, which again, here are reflected by the Reynolds number. And so that's exciting. But of course, the question was here, you know, the, you know, the answer. So you know what you're supposed to get. So the idea we had was, okay, let's try to do that for the parameterization where we don't necessarily know the answer. And you know, trying to see if we actually can come up with something that is new uh, that we didn't know before. So here's what we've done. You know, we basically, again, use data to try to discover unknown equation for ocean mesoscales. Here, I'm gonna show you only the part of momentum that we've done it for um, you know, buoyancy and eddy energy as well. And of course, this idea can be applied to any part of the climate system. It doesn't have to be applied to just ocean mesoscale parameterization. You can apply it to any other part um, of the climate system. And again, this is something we're up to right now. So I'll show you just a, a couple of slides of results on what we've done. So again, we took an idealized simulation, uh, diagnosed the, the missing forcing. Um, again, so in this case, we went from seven and a half kilometer to 30 kilometer. So diagnosed that missing forcing. And now what we're looking for is we're looking for, you know, a parameterization that's going to be the sum of some weights multiplying a set of basis function that we're going to give the algorithm. I'm going to ask the algorithm to, again to predict, you know, the missing forcing, the best possible missing forcing, given a set of basis function. So, as I said, we take the high resolution model input. We're going to give the algorithm. We're going to give the sparse regression algorithm a library of, of 200 function roughly. Uh, that depends on the resolved velocities, the temperature gradient, and so on and so forth. And we go up to second order derivatives. So there are a couple of reasons for why. One is because you know you need to keep everything in memory, and that's not easy. Uh, so we were limited a little bit by that. And second is at the end of the day, you need to implement that in the climate model. And to do that, um, you know the the basically the order of your derivative uh, is a little bit limited, right? Because you can't have an infinitely large uh, stencil that you can implement. But so this is something we're kind of revisiting right now, but that was one of the decisions we started with. Um, and then we actually go through this kind of iterative sparse Bayesian regression, which is different than the Rudy et al paper actually, because we find this method to be a lot more stable. And so the algorithm basically prune through that library of function, you know, we give it the threshold. We say, okay, you know, if this function you know, matches the prediction, you know, keep it or, or drop it, uh, you know, if you're below a certain threshold. And basically, you know, prune through that set of function, library of function, and just keep a certain number that explain a certain amount of the variance. So there's a little bit of a choice, of course, of, you know, uh, how much of the variance you want to keep. But at the end of the day, all you end up with is basically weights that have you know, some kind of uncertainty associated with them because it's a sparse Bayesian regression, right? So the algorithm is called relevance vector machine, by the way, if you're interested, uh, multiplying a set of basis function. Okay, so here's what we get. I'm not gonna get into the detail. I just wanna kind of show it and have to take question at the end. So we kept only a certain number of basis function uh, that explain between you know, 50 and 70% of the variance, meaning that it can recover about 70% of the missing forcing. I can add a few more, I'll you know, go up by a few percent, but not much more than that. And what we found is that first, the algorithm learn uh, something that is actually a, a symmetric stress tensor, which is something that we would expect uh, when we're looking at those properties. Also, we made sure that all the basis function could be written as the divergence of a flux, so then we conserve momentum. So that was kind of a nice property. And also the parameter that was multiplying each, each one of the basis function uh, 
was pretty, were all pretty close to one another. So we kind of encapsulated all of them in one parameter that has no, uh, no space dependent. So it's one coefficient that multiply this kind of stress tensor over here. And that stress tensor depends on the vorticity and the sharing and stretching of, of the fluid. That was pretty exciting because it's something that you know resembled a parameterization we came up with a few years ago. So, so we could actually explain and understand it pretty well. And so again, I'm not going to go into the detail of that. So in this case, you know, we came up with something that we actually kind of you know discover ourselves a few years ago. But there are some differences uh, between what the algorithm has learned and what and what we proposed a few years back. But here. The beauty of it is now you have a mathematical expression that you can go and analyze and understand the properties of and how the scale interaction between the eddies and the large scale um, are happening. So I'm just gonna show you just one more thing, which is what happens when we implement, uh, you know, those parameterizations in. Um, so this is the equation discovery that we, that we came up with. It's gonna be the red curve. So in the same idealized model uh, that Milan uh, you know, kindly created and, and made available online to all of us, and one based on uh, a neural network that has you know, conservation properties, so conserving momentum embedded in it. So again, especially in average kinetic energy as a function of time. Gray curve is the coarse resolution model. Uh, the high resolution simulation is the cyan curve over here. So again, more kinetic energy in the high resolution simulation. When we implement uh, the neural network with embedded uh, you know, conservation, this is the violet line that you see here. But again, we had to tune it down because otherwise the simulation was a little bit unphysical or very unphysical. Uh, but at this point, it does a pretty decent job. And over here are the equation discovery uh, parameterization. So it gets us halfway there. Uh, roughly. And this one was because we ended up with a little bit of numerical instabilities along the way, but something we're working on and we think we've solved actually. So, you know, that was a little bit of a show and tell, um, you know, and, and trying to pinpoint, you know, what the opportunities are and what the challenges are. I think, you know, parameterization will remain in demand for decades to come in climate simulation. So they, they're not going away anytime soon. So why not to use the data and machine learning algorithm to see if we can actually improve on the current parameterization, but also on you know understanding uh, of those processes. So you know that's the way we see it. Uh, and equation discovery is one example there, right? But deep learning is another one. Uh, if you actually manage uh, you know to interpret them, find a way to interpret them. But if all you need is skill, then they're still you know doing a really good job. So I feel like there's a way to actually merging both approaches and that's something we're doing right now. So can we get the best of equation discovery and deep learning uh, to both improve our understanding of the physics and, um, you know, uh, and basically having high scale that we can implement in climate models. Um, you know, some thoughts and, and kind of a way forward. I think, you know, there are a lot of exciting possibilities. There's also a lot of hype, right? Everybody's working on machine learning right now to, you know, to do something. I think one has to be careful. Uh, there are many challenges ahead and, and we can't just assume they're not there. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, bringing physics and data uh, together is definitely a way forward. There's a lot of information to extract in the data. Machine learning algorithm for me are just an additional tool uh, in my bag, the same way I use, you know, theory or climate models, then machine learning is just another one. And, you know, I think in general, it's always good to have, you know, diverse approaches. So you can actually, you know, try things out and combine them when necessary. And there's no way that, you know, that it's not good for science. It can help us actually accelerate, um, again, both the field of climate science in general, but also modeling. Would they be as transformational to climate model uh, as robotic and, and NPL? You know, it, it remains to be seen uh, when we think about machine learning and AI, they really transformed other aspects. We hope that they can transform, uh, you know, climate physics. But again, I think there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges that uh, I'm sure many people in the audience are keen to work on. And just a couple of things, if you're interested in those, in those ideas. So we have a, a program at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics this fall on machine learning for the physics of climate. And so that, you know, encompasses everything, not just parameterization, by the way, from, you know, um, uh, you know, low order reduction to understand or understanding complexity within the data. And so I believe applications are still open if, if you're interested in joining. There's a conference at the beginning for one week and then uh, a long program for people who want to stay. And of course, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, things coming on the, the pipeline 
uh, with M squared line, which is our new project that really tackles the parameterization problem in a way that is interpretable, physics aware, and something we can implement in climate model. So I leave it at that and happy to take questions if there are any. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks a lot indeed for this very inspirational talk. Really exciting. Okay, questions. If people have questions, then please, I would ask you to raise your hand and then we can go through them. Okay, I don't see any, I don't see any right now, so let me uh, go ahead myself. You, you, you mentioned a couple of times that you had to tune down so if this additional term that you learned uh, with your model to make sure that the model doesn't go haywire and that you know, it stays physical and so on. Is there any difficult, is, is there any danger into running something that is subtly wrong, but also incorrect and that you wouldn't necessarily notice and then fix by dialing down sort of such an additional term? Yeah, um, absolutely. So we made the assumption, we made a very strong assumption that what, we're, what we were learning was the truth, right? And so it's kind of an interesting, you know, that's an interesting problem to some extent because it's not the truth. We still diagnosed it from, you know, a simulation that is incorrect to some extent. So it is possible that we're also learning something that is imperfect. And that's one of the issues. So what we're trying to do right now is trying to actually bring observations. So by what we call transfer learning. So you learn, you know, this missing term from your climate simulation that you know is not 100% correct, uh, but, you know, nonetheless the best you've got. And then we recalibrate with observations, which are technically uh, a little bit more true. And that's really, you know, that's really the way we, we trying to approach that. That's a very good question. I see, thanks a lot. Okay, Jonathan, you also have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi there, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Hey, Jonathan. Um, I had two questions, if that's okay. Um, sort of, Please. Sort of, first one was, when you were looking at uh, how well it was performing in inverted commas um, against the high resolution model, uh, for kinetic energy, you were you were taking the spatially integrated kinetic energy over the whole ocean, and really what what you what you want is the kinetic energy in the right places, you know, uh, correct both at the surface and correct. and uh, I mean uh, you've muted yourself. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And so you know the 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 thing is like if I look at the map then I will actually see the correlation in the right places um, in, you know, in the regions where we need a kinetic energy. So the correlation definitely does, does a better job, even when we look at spatial maps. The one thing that uh, we don't do very well, I, I forgot to say it, is actually the mean state itself. So say the mean velocities are not as good as what we would want. So there is an improvement, but not as good as what we would want. We're trying it out actually in more complicated model and now we're seeing much better improvements. So we're looking at a bit more turbulent fluids and things like this. Well, that was sort of my second question. You also said that you don't conserve momentum, but, and, and how difficult or possible would it be to, to have a constraint in the CNN or the, the deep learning approach, whatever you use, to have conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, conservation of salinity, whatever it is you, you know, you want to solve for, because I think that that, you know, you don't want some horrible drift or bias or something, you know, like the ocean getting salty or whatever it is. Um, is, is it, how possible is it to impose those sort of constraints in, in the learning algorithm? Yeah, so the total one, that's something we've done, right? So we kind of, you know, self-corrected initially, we didn't conserve momentum. Then we built within the architecture themselves. Uh, you can build within the layers, conservations, so there are different ways you can do that. Either you learn, you know, so the fluxes rather than divergence of the flux, and then you know you directly implement the flux, uh, so then it's divergence free. Uh, or there are so that's one approach. For example, you can build it within the architecture. Um, usually that's the way we kind of think about it. There are a couple of papers that came out putting hard constraints or soft constraints within the loss function, where you have an additional you know uh, way to actually impose conservation. So that's there are definitely multiple methods now. Uh, but the one, one thing I would say as a caveat is the climate system is not the closed system, right? So for me, the part I'm thinking about right now and thinking ahead is, yes, there are some conservation properties, but we also have exchange between medium. And so that's the one I'm still scratching my head on because for different parts, I don't know how to impose that. Yeah. So, 
So that's not, that was not your question because I know how to answer your question, but the next one is more complicated for me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, actually, I have a second question, uh, which is sort of a bit vague and a bit looking forward. So you've mostly focused on correcting your simulation one specific you know, way. You've identified some small scale physics in which your simulation is incorrect, and then you've tried to correct that. And I'm you know, trying to think about generalizations of this very nice technique, try fields and try problems and so on, where the simulation mm -hmm. might be wrong in multiple independent but non-equivalent ways, so to speak. Do you have any intuition of how simple or, or difficult it would be to generalize that and to have sort of multiple terms that are learned either simultaneously or after you know one after the other and then everything uh, added on top of one another would that make sense yeah absolutely so so i mean in this case we are learning a vector technically right so we are learning two components of a vector uh, at the same time now the question is always going to be do you have the right data set for that um, you need a data set that will actually capture the interaction between the different you know, pieces. And so, yes, so this is something we're thinking about as well, absolutely. Okay, nice. But non-trivial nonetheless, right? Because, sure, uh, because again, the phase space now is changing quite drastically and you require mm -hmm. very strong, you're putting very strong constraint on your phase space, mm -hmm. which can be good and bad at the same time. It's good for physics, it's bad for the algorithm sometimes because it's hard for it to converge. Yeah, I see, I see, nice, okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions? If that's not the case, then let me thank you very much again, Laura, for this great talk and for taking the time to answer the questions and hope to see you all again next week at the same time. Thanks, Thanks. everyone.